Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Victor, for this kind introduction. And first of all, I would like to warmly thank uh, Johan and Victor for this uh, invitation. So as Victor said, I'm rather a newcomer in your community because basically I come from spectroscopy and uh, material science, uh, and I got involved in uh, cultural heritage only a few years ago. Uh, but it was a real pleasure to attend this meeting uh, these two days because uh, it really showed uh, how cultural uh, um, heritage science is a multidisciplinary science which combines different approaches from physics, chemistry, and art history. Yeah. So the point of my talk uh, uh, this afternoon uh, uh, will be the problem of the degradation of green pigments which were, were mostly used in easel painting during the Renaissance. And these pigments are uh, carboxylate copper complexes which suffer from some kind of chemical instability. And uh, these degradation transform changes their color from green to brown uh, over centuries and even uh, decades. And the purpose of our work was to get some insight into the mechanisms uh, of this degradation by uh, focusing specifically with dedicated spectroscopic techniques, focusing specifically on these carboxylate copper complexes to monitor the changes in their chemical structure. And uh, I would also like to mention uh, my co-workers who are deeply involved in this project, Didier Gourier, Anne-Solène Leau, and François Mirambé. This is a common work, of course. So the pigments at, at stake are um, copper acetate, also known as uh, verdigris, and copper resinate. Uh, they are both binuclear complexes of copper, and copper is in the two plus states in these, uh, in these complexes. And uh, the two copper ions are bridged by carboxylate ligands. So uh, we have acetate ligands, of course, in the case of copper acetate. And we have abietate ligands in the case of copper resinate. And traditionally, these uh, uh, pigments were prepared uh, for copper acetate by corrosion of metallic copper in the vinegar. And to prepare copper resinate, uh, we start from copper acetate, which is mixed in with a terpenic resin. In a, it is heated and mixed with the terpenic resin. And during this process, the acetate ligands are replaced by abietate uh, groups. So the, these uh, pigments were mostly used in easel paintings and mostly at the end of Middle Ages and uh, during the Renaissance period. Uh, copper resinate was given up rather early, and copper acetate was used probably until the um, 19th century, sorry, uh, uh, and replaced by uh, uh, new pigments, uh, synthetic pigments, uh, which were available as soon as the, they could be produced by the chemical industry. And Probably the most probable reason why these pigments were abandoned is because they, they are chemically unstable and because they suffer from a browning, a, a change of their color from green to, to brown. And a typical example that can be seen on this famous painting, Saint Anne by Leonardo Vinci, which can be seen in the Louvre. And if you look at this tree in the background, uh, it looks brown nowadays, but initially it was green. So there is a evident, obvious change in color over all of the centuries. So what could be the potential causes for this uh, phenomenon? Uh, it's not a problem with some chemical incompatibility with other pigments in the painting because uh, we have no observation of co any correlations with any specific other pigments. It's also, oh sorry, too fast. It is also not a problem with the oil, the binding oil only, because it's known when the oil degrades, it turns to yellow, but not to brown. Okay. And it was made clear that 
the copper complexes in some way were involved in this process. And also the fact that in general the most exposed areas of, of painting, so most exposed to light and ambient atmosphere, was, were also the most altered area, suggested that light and possibly oxygen could have some also effect on this process. So as an example of the potential effect of light, uh, we have these examples from this uh, painting uh, by Agnolo Bronzino, where we, uh, two samples could have been collected very close to each other, but one sample was collecting, collected in, uh, in an area which was initially protected by the frame of the painting. And another samples were collected in an area which ex was exposed to light and atmosphere. And as you can see on the samples collect protected from light, the green color is sustained, the, the, the sample is not altered, but on the sample which was exposed to light, there is a brown part which develops at the surface, and uh, there's darkening here at the surface of the sample. So this shows that in some way, light must, be, uh, must have some kind of effect on the browning. Another example shows that also oxygen may interfere with the process. Uh, so there is a sample here from the, this painting, Déposition de Croix by uh, Jean Fouquet. Uh, on the optical image, you can see that uh, the, the browning, the damage, occurs only on specific areas. You have areas which, are, uh, which conserve their green color, but other areas uh, where the browning develops. And uh, the browning develops in, in area where you have a high density of cracks. So it, it's all like we have some kind diffusion of species and most probably oxygen within the tracks, which uh, allows the penetration of the browning in depth into the layer and a slower diffusion uh, perpendicular to the cracks, which explain this kind of dendritic shape of the browning brown areas. So the, the question uh, which is to be addressed now, is there any kind of chemical process which includes light and oxygen, which can turn the color of copper carboxylate pigments from green to brown. So we used an approach based on model samples. So we prepare the most uh, simple samples by mixing either copper acetate or copper resinate with linseed oil, which is the most common binder, uh, this oil can be either raw oil or boiled oil and coat the substrate and let it dry for some, some days and submit it to irradiation with light and observe what happened. Uh, the, the advantage of these, um, these pigments of these uh, copper complexes is that, of course, because they are colored complex, they have optical properties but also they, are, uh, they have magnetic properties. They are para paramagnetic uh, species. So we can use both electron paramagnetic resonance and optical absorption spectroscopy, which are very selective uh, techniques and which are very sensitive to any chemical changes in the structure about the copper ions. So, Maybe you are not very familiar with EPR, certainly with optical spectroscopy, but uh, for you to understand the conclusions that we get from these uh, techniques, uh, I need maybe to give you some details about the electronic structure and the properties of these kind of complexes. Uh, I start with the most simple uh, complex, uh, which is a mononuclear copper duplex complex and that uh, will be called a monomer. So we have the uh, 3D orbitals of the copper 2 plus ions, which are split by the interactions with the ligands, 
and the nine electrons of the copper 2 plus are occupy these orbitals, and we are left with one single electron in the higher d orbital, the dx2 minus y2 uh, orbital. So this is an unpaired electron, and this electron carries a magnetic moment. So this gives to this electron some magnetic properties. And when you apply an external field, you have two orientation, possible orientations of the magnetic moment of this electron along the field, either opposite or in the same direction of the field. These two orientations no longer have, have different energies in a magnetic field. And if you irradiate your molecule with microphotons, frequency about 10 gigahertz, you can have an absorption of the microwave at a specific field. So this is what is called electron paramagnetic resonance, and you can record uh, an EPR spectrum. If we consider now a binuclear complex, so with two copper ions now, with ligands in between, uh, the situation is a little bit more complicated. So we have now one unpaired electron on each uh, copper ion. And uh, there is an interaction between these two electrons, which is called the exchange interaction. So we have two possible states for this pair. A, the ground state where the magnetic moments of the two electrons are opposite and cancel out. So that you have in this ground state, the complex has no magnetic properties and you cannot perform any EPR spectroscopy on when the complexes are in this ground state. But there is a low-lying excited state where the two magnetic moments of the pair are parallel and in that case, if the complex is in this state, it has magnetic properties, and you can do EPR on the complex when they are in this state. And the splitting between these two states, which is the, called the exchange splitting, is of the same order of the available thermal energy at room temperature, so that a part a fraction of the complex occupy this level, something like about 10 to 20% of the complex are in this state at room temperature. So you can observe an EPR spectrum for the binuclear complex. So to show you, not too fast, sorry. <laughs> so to show you an exa examples of EPR spectra that we can observe with these complexes, in the case of copper acetate, we have only dimers, no monomers, okay? So we have the EPR spectrum of dimers, uh, so it is recorded as a function of the magnetic field. I do not go into the detail of the shape of this spectrum. It is an absorption <coughs> derivative and not an absorption as usual in spectroscopy. So just keep in mind it, that it has two features, one feature here at low field and one feature here at higher field which are highly distinctive uh, of this complex. If we now consider copper resonate, in copper resonate you have a mixture of dimers and monomers. In the EPR spectrum of copper resonate, you can, of course, observe the features specific here and here of dimers, but in the middle you have a new signal, and this signal is specific of monomers. The interesting point with EPR is that we can measure from the intensity of the spectra, we can measure the relative proportions of dimers and monomers, and this will be a helpful quantity for us. If we now move on to the optical properties, we need to go into the details of the electronic uh, energy level diagrams of, your, of the complexes. And we start again with a monomer, which is the most simple situation. So we have a monomer, the copper ion, the ligands around it. And we have two types of transition. Your first type of transition corresponds to excitation of electrons within the d orbitals of the copper 2 plus ion. These are called DD transitions. And these transitions 
uh, appear about 15,000 wave numbers. So this is in the red range of the visible uh, spectrum here. And there is another type of transitions, which are called ligand metal charge transfer transitions, whereby an electron is transfer transferred from the ligand onto the copper ion. So now the unpaired electron is in this excited state on the ligand. Okay. And these transition, ligand metal charge transfer transitions, appear in the UV and rather far in the UV for a monomer. For a dimer, we have more or less the same pattern, but of course modified. For a diamond, we now have to take into account these exchange interactions between the two unpaired electrons, one on each copper ion. So we, we find here the splitting that we saw before, which was responsible for the EPR response of the system. But, so we also have DD transitions, which correspond to excitations of the two unpaired electrons within the D orbitals, and these DD transitions as in the monomer, occur here in the red range. And here there is a major difference between the DD transitions in a monomer and the DD transition in a dimer. In a monomer, these transitions are normally forbidden by selection rules, so they have a low probability. Normally, these transitions are weak for a monomer. In a dimer, these transitions are allowed by the selection rules. So the intensity of this transition in dimer are fairly high. Okay. And in a dimer, you also have ligand metal charge transfer transitions, but they are shifted to lower energy because here again of this interaction, exchange interaction between the unpaired electron in the complex. So here now on, between one unpaired electron of the of on one copper ion and the unpaired electron on the ligand after charge transfer. And this exchange interaction splits these excited states and shifts downward the lowest excited state here. So the charge transfer transition in a dimer are shifted to lower energy and there is a specific absorption band, specific of a dimer corresponding to this charge transfer transition still in the UV, but closer to the visible range. Okay. And you have a dip in the absorption spectrum corresponding to the green blue range, which is responsible for the color of the diamond. Okay. So, using these two spectroscopic techniques, optical absorption spectroscopy and EPR, um, EPR uh, we were able to address two types of transformation of the complex. A first transformation occurs as soon as you mix the complexes, the copper carboxylate complexes, with a binding oil and during the driving, drying of this oil. And this is clearly exemplified by the case of mixing copper acetate with linseed oil. So this is the PR spectrum of pure copper acetate here. And on top, the PR spectrum of the freshly, fresh mixture of copper acetate with linseed oil. At that moment, the oil is still viscous. Okay. So as you can see, so I remind you that copper acetate is made of pure dimers. So the fresh mixing, in the fresh mixing, we still find only dimers in our mixture. And this is the color of the mixture, uh, the fresh mixture. But when you wait until a few days, until the oil is dried, you can see a change in the EPR spectrum. You can still find dimers, of course, but you can see now appearing the signal typical of monomers. That means that during, the, because of the mixing with the binding oil and during the, dry, uh, the drying of the oil, some dimers are dissociated into the monomers. But there is no change in the color. 
it is still green. There is no browning. So this has nothing to do with the browning which is observed on painting. And this dissociation of monomers into dimers is confirmed by optical spectroscopy. If you look at the optical absorption spectrum of pure copper acetate, you have the DD transitions here, which are fairly intense if you compare them to the dimer ligand metal charge transfer transition. If you now look at the optical absorption spectrum of the mixture of copper acetate with linked in oil after drying, you can see now that the intensity of the DD transition is lower than the intensity of the dimer ligand metal charge transfer transition. We have a decrease of the intensity of the DD transitions. And this is, of course, in agreement with the transformation of some dimers, which show normally intense DD transitions, into monomers, which show weak DD transitions. So, how can we account for this uh, dissociation of dimers? Okay. So, linseed oil, as so you, you know it, is made of triglyceride, uh, triesters, but also contains uh, fatty acids. And here you have a pigment grains. So, we can imagine that we have uh, interactions with these uh, dimers with uh, carboxylate compounds from fatty acids, which dissociate these two. Uh, this dimer into two independent monomers. But this effect is not responsible for the change in color uh, of the pigment. So now we have to move on to what could be the possible <coughs> if, uh, cause for the change of color. So we move on to the, what happens when our pigment mixed with oil interacts with light. So we, we prepared uh, some samples, resinate here mixed with boiled linseed oil, acetate with raw linseed oil, and irradiated with UV light, uh, specifically within the dimer ligand metal charge transfer transition here at, at this wavelength. And as you can see, with increasing irradiation time, at the point where uh, uh, we irradiated, we have a brown spot which, which grows here, with increasing irradiation time in both cases. So we can reproduce the darkening of the pigment by irradiation specifically in this uh, dimer uh, absorption band. Okay. So, is it, we have a browning. But are the complexes, copper complexes, involved in the browning or is it an effect on the binding oil only. So we prepare samples with only linseed oil, which were dry for a few days, and perform the same. So linseed oil has an absorption spectrum, an absorption band in the, in the UV. Okay. Now these are transitions between uh, bonding and anti-bonding pi type orbital or C double C bond. Okay. So a transparency window in the visible and we irradiated at the same wavelength by UV light here. And what happens upon irradiation? The absorption edge shifts to higher wave numbers, shifts to the UV, not into the visible. So the transparency window indeed is increased. So the oil only after irradiation cannot explain the change in color. So this really has something to do with the copper complexes. So let's see what we could get from the opti optical absorption spectroscopy. So we performed uh, optical absorption precisely on the brown spot. So this is the absorption spectrum of the fresh sample, so no browning. So we have the DD transition, dimer absorption down here, the deep here in the green region. And after irradiation, in the brown region, we can see here a new absorption band which appears, whether with resonant and boiled linseed oil or acetate with raw linseed oil, at about 20,000 uh, wave numbers, so that we have now a more or less continuous absorption developing into the visible 
no real dip now in the green, so this is the reason why the color turns, turns to brown. So what could be the origin of this new absorption band? Here we can make an analogy uh, with other types of dimers of copper ions. Indeed, these uh, dimers of copper ions are well known in some biological molecules, such as hemocyanin, that we can find in the blood of some animals. So this is hemocyanin, so a dimer of copper 2 plus ions, and there is a specific variant of hemocyanin, which is oxyhemocyanin, where you have a dioxygen here between the two copper ions. Okay. So we have a peroxo complex, copper 2, O2, copper 2. And this peroxo complex has a specific absorption band in the visible, which is missing, ah, sorry, uh, which is missing in the deoxy analog of this complex. So the deoxy is when this O2 molecule is removed. Okay. So, so this new absorption band that we observed in the carboxylate complexes after iridition could be related to the formation of peroxo complex of the dimer copper O2 copper. And this is agreement in agreement with the results that we get from electron paramagnetic resonance. With EPR, we can measure the relative proportions of monomers and dimers uh, within the mixture. So we have the situation here for the sample made of resonant and boiled lidseed oil, acetate and raw lidseed oil. You have the proportions here before irradiation in green dimer, in blue monomer, and after irradiation. Okay. What we observe is first a total decrease, a decrease in the total amount of detected copper 2 plus, both in dimers and monomers. The, um, the proportion of monomer may increase in some cases or decrease. But in both cases, the proportion of dimers decreases. We have a decrease in the total amount of detected dimers by PR. And this can be fully understood if we consider the electron, uh, uh, the electron energy level diagram of the, uh, of the dimer complex, whether a pure carboxylate complex or a peroxo dimer complex. So I remind you, in the pure carboxylate complex, we have this low-lying excited state which is occupied at room temperature which is responsible for the EPR spectrum that is detected. And we have this charge transfer absorption band in the UV at 20,000 uh, web, web numbers. In the peroxo copper Dimer. So we have this O2 molecule here between the two uh, copper ions. Interaction between the two unpaired electrons here is larger than in the carboxylate dimer. So this shifts upward this state, which was responsible for the EPR spectrum. So in the peroxo dimer, this state at room temperature is no longer occupied. It is empty all molecules are in this ground state, which is EPR silent. So this is the reason why you do not observe any EPR spectrum for a peroxo dimer. And this is the reason why the total intensity in detected dimer decreases after irradiation. And in the excited states here, where we have all, now only one unpaired electron on the copper ions and one unpaired electron on the ligands, now on the dioxygen ligand here, the exchange interaction is stronger than in the case of carboxylate dimer. So this shifts downwards the absorption threshold here, down to 22,000 wave numbers. So this is the reason why we have this emerging absorption band for the uh, dimer after irradiation. So, we come to a potential mechanism which could be responsible for the change in color of carboxylate uh, complexes in green pigments. 
We start with a, a dimer with two cop copper two plus ions, bridged by four uh, carboxylate ligands. One, two, three, four. And when this complex is irradiated by a photon in the dimer absorption band, so we have a transfer during this irradiation, a transfer of an electron from a ligand onto a copper ion. So a copper ion is reduced into copper one, from copper two into copper one, and a ligand can be removed. So now we have a dimer, but only one copper is in the two plus state. So only this copper can be detected by optical absorption spectroscopy. Copper one has no absorption and only this ion can be also detected by EPR2. So this complex, copper one, copper two, behaves like a monomer. If this complex happens to absorb a second photon, another ligand is removed, and the second copper ion is reduced into copper one. So now we are left with a dimer of copper one, copper one, which is both EPR silent no PR spectrum, and optically inactive, no optical absorption. Okay. So this explains, this is also an explanation why the amount of dimers detected by EPR may also decrease. Okay. This also explains why in some cases, after irradiation, the amount of monomer in some cases may increase if the reaction stops here. And anyway, in any case, the reaction stops here if there is no oxygen in the environment. If now you have oxygen, so oxygen may diffuse within the sample, interact with this copper one, copper one dimer to bridge the two copper, uh, two copper ions. But to do that, uh, electrons are now transferred back from copper onto the dioxygen, so copper are oxi reoxidized into copper two plus, which creates this peroxodimer of copper two plus ions, which is EPR silence, no EPR spectrum, but optically active, it create this new absorption band in the visible, which is responsible for the browning. <coughs> so we have a potential mechanism which could explain the browning of the, these uh, green pigments. But as you can see, this mechanism involves only the copper complexes and not any interaction with the binding ore. So is there any effect of the binding ore on the, on the browning? Indeed, we observe some effect, which has to do with whether we use raw linseed oil or boiled linseed oil. As you can see here, we have a sample made of acetate with boiled linseed oil. On the other side, a sample also made with acetate, but here with a raw linseed oil. For the samples with boiled linseed oil, after irradiation, we have no browning, no effect. For the sample with raw linseed oil, we have a strong darkening at the irradiated spot. And we have an intermediate situation uh, corresponding to the resinate with boiled linseed oil. And if we, we can correlate that with the proportion of monomers in the mixture before irradiation. There is a correlation between the proportion of monomers before irradiation and the photochemical stability of the pigment. The higher the photochemical stability, so to the left, here, the higher the proportion of monomers in the mixture before irradiation. So how can we count for that? So this is only a tentative explanation, but uh, we can try. So here we have a sample made of boy, pig, pigment grain within boiled lidseed oil. And here a sample of same pigment grain within raw linseed oil. In boiled linseed oil, after drying, we have a creation of a large amount of monomers. They come from the dissociation of dimers at the surface here and migrate in a layer about 
the pigment grain. Okay. In the case of raw linseed oil, we have very few monomers which are created by interaction with the oil. Now, if we irradiate, and in presence of dioxygen, dioxygen tends to diffuse through the, through the oil, and when trying to reach the pigment grain, has to first interact with the large amount of monomers surrounding the pigment grain. So we can imagine that some monomers trap dioxygen to make some kind of monomer O2 complexes so that oxygens cannot reach the pigment grain and so cannot interact with the dimers. And so, so you, you, it prevents the formation of peroxodimer complexes and this could be the explanation why we have no darkening when, irradiated, when we irradiate this kind of sample. In the case of raw linseed oil, we have a very low amount of monomers about the pigment grain, so oxygen can easily diffuse to the pigment grain and interact with the dimers in the dimer, creating a large amount of peroxodimers complex and inducing a darkening. So I come to some concluding remarks. Uh, first remarks regarding this, the, the use of spectroscopic technique. Uh, in the case of pigments, uh, which are made of transition ions, many pigments are made of transition ions. Of course, these transition ions are optically absorbing, but many of them, depending on the oxidation degree, uh, may be paramagnetic. And both types of spectroscopy, whether optical spectroscopy or electron parametric resins, are highly sensitive to the chemical environment and the chemical structure about uh, the transition ion. So there are very powerful techniques to inform you about any chemical changes in the structure about uh, the, uh, the transition ion in the pigments. <coughs> In the specific case of these copper carboxylate uh, dimers, uh, we could identify some peroxo complex binuclear complexes, which could be, or at least which could contribute to the browning which is observed on, on real painting. But this is probably not the end of the story because there are still pending questions. Uh, one question is how can these uh, peroxodimers potentially interact with the binding oils? Uh, yesterday we had a, a lecture by uh, Ilaria about um, oxidative de degradation of, uh, of the oil. And here with this peroxo complex, we, have, we may have a reactive species which could trigger some further processes, degradation processes, or oxidation processes of the oil. So this is probably a point which would need to be investigated. So I am concluding here and just would like also to mention the students uh, who worked on this project, either PhD students or master students and who contributed to, the, uh, to these results. And now it is open to questions. <laughs>